going to look at kind of what it takes to unearth these stories of women in STEM. Um, one of these, uh, here with two best-selling female authors, but one of them in particular has really already kicked off a sort of a national movement and a national conversation, looking at the hidden figures in different STEM fields. Um, you're saying that people now actually say, like, the hidden figures of X, which has got to be a really awesome feeling. Um, so yeah, so maybe I can get each of you to uh, sort of tell me a little bit about what inspired your book idea, sort of how you came to even take on these projects. Um, well, I, I just really briefly, I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. My dad um, is a NASA scientist. He's now retired, a research scientist. And so the community that I grew up in um, had a lot of people who worked in technical fields, a lot of scientists, engineers, mathematicians, um, many of whom um, included the, the women that I, I wrote about in my book um, were African American or women or both. So I, I had this. Um, view of what a scientist was from the time I was a child that was already very diverse and very inclusive. Um, and so uh, I, I'd really taken it for granted, but it was a moment when my husband, we were visiting my parents, we ran into some of uh, the women who had worked at NASA with my dad, and my husband, you know, with very fresh eyes said, wow, I can't believe that this story happened, I can't believe these women were doing this, and I can't believe that I never heard about that, and, and why is that? And that was really, the, for me, the spark that created um, this, this odyssey, it became this odyssey of hidden figures. Um, so my book is about women who worked as code breakers during World War II. There were 10,000 uh, women who came to Washington to do this work. I'm so grateful to Margot for so many reasons. But Hidden Figures really has entered the lexicon. So for those of us who've come after her book, people will say, oh, those were the hidden figures of World War II, code breaking. And so it's just, yes, yes, they were. Uh, uh, and, you know, I have a husband's story, too, actually, because um, uh, the, the wartime code breaking operations became the NSA, the National Security Agency. And uh, my husband was actually reading a declassified document uh, about the Soviet code breaking project that we did during the war. And, um, and he also noticed in this declassified history that 90% uh, of the people working on that project were women. And, and also thought that that seemed really interesting. Many of them were former school teachers. And, uh, and so, I went, I thought that was interesting and went out to the NSA to talk to their historians and found that there was a much larger story of women working on Japanese and German code breaking also during the war. So um, that's how it, it came to be. Yeah. And so for, for both of you, these stories seem to have been sort of hiding in plain sight. H how did you go about doing just the research for this? You know, if it's something that not a lot of people know about, how did you find out about it? And, and what were some of the, you know, maybe the challenges in that? Um, well, I'm, first of all, I'm really curious, and you just said, you know, talking to the NSA historian, so I, I definitely want to hear those stories. Um, for me, it was uh, really putting together a lot of disparate sources. So the story really was there. There are bits and pieces of the history everywhere. Um, it's just that it hadn't coalesced into one narrative. So um, NASA Langley, the NASA historians have been amazing. Um, the families of the women um, have been wonderful in terms of sharing their stories, photos, um, Sunday school program. I mean, just, you know, all of these, these different pieces of, of history and life. And then, of course, digging into the National Archives and digging into um, the documents from World War II and finding boxes that, you know, had never been opened yes. since they had been, you know, archived. Yeah. Um, and then really saying, okay, now I've got all these pieces. What's the story? And how do I tell this story so that these women are given a voice? So it's not just, <coughs> excuse me, me um, sort of uh, writing my story, but sort of interpreting their story. I really wanted their voices to, to lead everything. Yeah, so um, the NSA historians were also extremely helpful, uh, and the curator at the Cryptologic Museum that we have in Fort Meade. Um, and, and they really genuinely wanted to get this story out. But also, I think, if you're the NSA, like, what do you want? One more story about Edward Snowden, or would you like a story about heroic female code breakers? So there was some self-interest in, uh, in helping to get the story out. But I, I just really salute the historians for our federal agencies, because they're very committed to the histories of their agencies. In my case, 
uh, these were women who had been born in 1920 or 1921 or 22. And I knew that even when I got started, they'd be in their early 90s. Mm -hmm. So my reporting was a sort of a desperate, simultaneous uh, attempt to go into National Archive records, but really first to find the women mm -hmm. and to convince them that it was finally OK to talk, because they had been told when they came to Washington during the war that they would be shot if they talked about what that wow. they did. It was a top secret code breaking right. effort. And they kept the secret even after the war also. And nobody had told them, nobody had sought them out to tell them that it was OK to finally talk. Um, so it was sort of like those those Japanese soldiers who you hear staggering out of the jungle 20 years after the war, not knowing that it's over. In this case, these women didn't know that the oath of secrecy had been lifted and that it was okay to talk. So in part, I was I had to convince them that that they would not be put in prison, uh, literally, wow. yeah. uh, if they wow. if they talk. <laughs> but then then once I mean once 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 uh, once they were convinced, they were very eager. I, I I would assume it was maybe the same in your case. Very very eager to tell their stories. Um, amazingly sharp memories about the code breaking work that they did, and and I think also. So a desire to finally get credit for for what they had done. And Margo, maybe you can talk about kind of the impact that, that Hidden Figures has had, I mean, either in the communities that you were trying to reach with the book or maybe in, in surprising places that you didn't realize that it would resonate. Uh, it, you know, honestly, um, so the book came out in September of last year. And for the last however long that's been, year and, and two months, I guess, um, I have been just completely blown away by the reaction and by the persistence of the reaction. Um, but also by the chain reaction. Like, I am, I cannot wait to read your book. I mean, <laughs> we're just talking about, you know, backstage, you know, just looking at some of the pictures. Um, and looking at pictures, that was a huge part of the research for the book, of, you know, trying to figure out where people were and what they were wearing and who they were sitting next to. And then all of a sudden, you know, there are all these other stories. It's, it's as if we, you know, we're just talking that somebody, we were sitting in a room that was completely dark and we turned it on and there's a whole room full of women yeah. that we haven't seen. And so I, I think the thing for me that's been just so incredible um, is to have told this story that has this personal connection and also I think has a lot to do with my interest in the American dream and social mobility and race and gender, but to see like so many different other kinds of people embrace the story, men embrace the story mm -hmm. and find inspiration. And um, to say, hey, what, what else are we missing? You know, if, if we miss this story, these rooms full of women all over the world, breaking codes, doing math, computing, fueling the 20th century, well, geez, what else are we missing here? How, who, do, who, do we, who do we need to see now? Right, and the fact that these stories have been hidden up until now is why we're still having these absurd conversations about whether women belong in the tech sector. You know, why, why are there aren't more women in Silicon Valley? Maybe they're just not biologically suited. Yeah. Uh, and so hopefully these stories, um, well, I don't think there's any question that these stories will make a difference in that conversation. Yeah. One can only hope. Right. <laughs> uh, well, we can only hope. So, so, I mean, you guys are writing about things that happen in, in the 40s and I guess the 50s and 60s, right? And, and so, I, you know, I'm wondering what were the circumstances that, that brought so many women into these fields during those times? And also kind of um, what happened after that? Because now we don't have this, this um, you know, huge amount of, of women, you know, computers. Uh, working, you know, we don't necessarily have a lot of women in cybersecurity. So, and, and meanwhile, those fields are exploding. So, I'm just curious as to how you see the trajectory of of how those women got to be in those fields, and then also how they kind of tr trickled out. It seems, yeah. Uh, well, like Liza's women, um, the women of Hidden Figures came during World War II. Um, there was there was this, uh, actually the uh, the first computing pool at the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory, which is the kernel of NASA in Hampton, Virginia. Um, where uh, there were five white women, um, and th this computing pool concept really worked, and then it expanded. Um, so uh, they came during World War II. They stayed on during the Cold War. Um, and then, and, and this is something that I think is, I'd really be interested in hearing your point of view, but um, I think that what happened is that when a computer became an electronic device, um, a capital investment of a million bucks, which was a lot of money back in you know the early 60s, whatever. 
that's when, you know, the computing supervisors became men. When it was a room full of women and the investment was a $500 computing machine times 25 times a salary that was often less than a man, that was a different set of economics than this big capital investment and a sexy computing um, machine. Um, and so at, at least at NASA, in those computing groups, uh, once that happened, the supervisors, and you can look at the organizational chart, the supervisors of those, those, that first level supervisory group, all of the women were gone and then men came in. Hmm. Yep. I, I think uh, exactly. I mean, obviously, my, my cohort came during the war. The men were all fighting. We needed to ramp up our intelligence in every way instantly. We needed thousands of people doing uh, signals interception and then the breaking of the signal codes. And so the men were literally gone. And so, you know, there, I literally found a document in which the Navy said, a Navy memo said, new source, women's colleges. Like somebody literally thought, okay, the men are gone. Where are we going to get these people? Let Let's start, uh, let's start establishing contacts and doing recruiting at women's colleges around the country. Uh, and also, you know, they were bringing in Native American code talkers. It was this moment of inclusivity because we were in a global emergency and the men were all on battleships or, you know, fighting in Europe. Uh, and I can tell you exactly what happened. I think, you know, with the computing industry, uh, because this was cybersecurity that, in my case, that the women were doing, and this was uh, this was hacking into enemy communication systems. So, but what happened after the war, in terms of the computer industry, um, you know, it became much more profitable. So, uh, uh, men were more attracted into the field. But also, a number of these women did stay on with the NSA. Some of the female codebreakers I write about stayed on and formed an early cohort of the NSA. But um, there was such pressure in the 1950s to if you got if you got married and got pregnant, you really were expected to go home. So, in one of my central characters, uh, who had been a school teacher in Mississippi, she got recruited. She came to Washington. She continued working at what would be the NSA after the war as a mathematician. Uh, in her personnel file, there were awards that she received. But there was a handwritten note when she got married and got pregnant and said, "I am resigning my position as a mathematician." at the National Security Agency because I'm expected to be home with my baby. That's literally what it said. There's no more, you know, during the war there was government-sponsored child care, and there was none of that. And so I think the women at the NSA, another character in my book, Ann Cara Christie, would rise to be the first female deputy director of the NSA. They did not get married and they did not have children. That was mm -hmm. the only way to, to stay in the field at that time. Why did the, why did the child care go away after the war? Because, I think, because the United States was so unnerved by all the social change that was taking place during the war, by all the young women who were getting on trains and coming to D.C. and living on their own, that they just wanted to stuff the genie back into the bottle. Okay. I think there was a lot of ambivalence even at the time. You would see these, I, when I was looking at the mm -hmm. posters, the sort of propaganda, motivational posters during the war, you know, Rosie the Riveter. But there were also posters that said, that would have a child saying to his mother as she goes off to the factory, dear mom, you know, dear mother, when will you stay home again? Mm -hmm. So it was sort of, it was baked in really from the start. There was uh, women at Goucher, uh, there was a, the president of Goucher um, talked about how uh, one of the company, one of the um, defense companies wanted 20 engineers from Goucher, which is a women's college, and it said, uh, give us beautiful ones for we don't want them on our hands after the war. The impl implication being that if they're beautiful, they're more likely to get married and then they'll stop working and so things can go back to normal. Wow. So that's just sort of a, a sampling of I, I sense the, the sexism maybe that was yeah. prevalent at the time. Um, and of course, I mean, the women in, in Hidden Figures had to deal with racism on top of sexism. So, and you know, obviously we're talking about things that happened decades ago, it was obviously way worse, but what are some of the, how, how did they deal with that? How did they deal with being sort of these newcomers in this sort of traditionally male and white space? Well, I, I think in particular for, um, for, for all of the women, and particularly for the black women, um, they started out as school teachers, so the women, they generally came with college degrees, and the, the salary that they got paid was two or three or more times what they were getting paid as school teachers, particularly for the black women who were working in segregated schools where they were already getting paid less than their white counterparts. So all of a sudden, they walked into these jobs that were, you know, I mean, this was a world that had not existed for them prior. So um, in World War II, you know, I remember interviewing some of the children of the women um, who were from that very first generation. And they were like, you know what, we are not letting these jobs go. Like, we, whatever it is we have to do, once the war is over, 
we are staying put right in this office. And, and that's what they did because what it meant was a generational transformation in the lives of, of their children and their grandchildren. Um, you know, it, it was the road to, uh, to, to permanent um, the American dream. It was the door that opened to the American dream. So um, they really uh, were not going to take no for an answer and, and, you know, really toughed it out in the face of um, <clears throat> sometimes explicit bias, sometimes, you know, uh, what we call implicit bias now, low expectations, um, constantly thinking that women were basically just the human version of their, the mechanical calculating machines that they used, um, that you would give them the numbers, they would do the calculations, you'd spit out the numbers, or they would, and then the engineers would take the numbers away. And it really took women saying, you know what, I am interested in this work, I am doing a great job, um, I'm curious about this, I want to do more. Like, they really had to assert themselves um, to sort of bring themselves out of the blind spots right. of, of the engineers. Yeah, probably more so than even today. Uh, yeah, ab <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, although, you know, what's really interesting about, um, I think, the, the setup is that there were groups of women then, you know, so they didn't have the isolation um, and the black women came in. There was a, a group of black women, mathematicians, all sitting there and, and working together. So they got to see themselves reflected on a daily basis and have conversations with people just like them um, about the work that, that delighted them. So, you know, that was something that um, was unusual, um, it, well, is unusual in terms of, of finding that today. And was that the case for them? Yeah, it code was, code? because again, because the men were in the field fighting, and there were some men in these code-breaking facilities. I mean, the Army in Arlington had a mostly civilian facility uh, that was 7,000 people, and, and or was 8,000 people, and 7,000 of those were women. The Navy had, where Homeland Security is now, that was the Navy's code-breaking compound, and there were 5,000 people there, and 4,000 of them were women. So it was huge cohorts of women. So even though there was sexism, the women outnumbered them men, um, you know, enormously. But I also found really some really interesting documents. It was a very, at least the Army's civilian operation, was a very sort of flat structure. It wasn't hierarchical. And if you were a smart 22-year-old, 23-year-old woman, uh, you could be put in charge of a unit almost instantly. And I, I saw one uh, instance of a cybersecurity unit where an older male college professor came in thinking he was going to head the unit, but there was a young 23-year-old woman who graduated from the University of Maryland majoring in, like, home economics or something, which was a major women tended to get stuck into. And her managerial skills were so pronounced that they just put her in charge of the unit, and the college professor was happy to be her assistant. Um, so it was, it was a rare moment of um, just you know, promoting based on actual talent. Wow. <laughs> um, OK, I have another question for you guys. But in, in a second, I'm going to take questions from the audience so you guys get ready. Um, but you know, I know you're writing about kind of you know, historical events, and, and this isn't really like policy books that you're writing. But did you have any insights into policies that might help more, encourage more women to get back into these STEM fields that you know, can in some, sometimes be really lucrative and rewarding careers? Um, you know, the thing about it is, <clears throat> and I think there's a lot of, obviously, discussion about um, diversity and inclusion and all of these things now. Um, you know, what they decided to do was to look for talent everywhere. They looked in women's colleges. They looked at historically black colleges. Um, they looked at women with a variety of talents and said, okay, maybe this woman who, you know, was, had trained as a stenographer could be uh, a computer, a mathematician. Um, and I think that, you know, this... <coughs> If, if you haven't looked everywhere, how do you know you found the best people? Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that that, and, and then once you get those critical masses of women who come in and perform and do these jobs, well, you know, that is, that is a numerical, empirical evidence supporting uh, what we're saying, that, you know, you look for people everywhere, you train good people, you put them in the job, you give them opportunities, and they perform. So I think that, you know, I, I think it's really, encouraging and exciting and inspiring to see these all of these stories come out, these success stories that we just brushed off over the years and say, wait a minute, let's dust off those numbers and, and see what, how those things can impact the way people are hired and, and scouted and recruited and trained you know, over the course of their careers in STEM fields. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, Margo, your book and the movie and the young adult version, I mean, that alone, like you've done it, you've, you've done, uh, that alone is going to attract, you know, so many young women into the field. But um, but I think also just everything that you're saying, after the war, all of these credential degree programs grow up. And so all of a sudden, tech companies, they're looking to Stanford, they're looking to MIT. And, you know, there's been so much winnowing that's gone, it's gone just, just for the people who end up at Stanford. So um, you have to kind of you know, try to find ways to go around that and to not always just be looking at the places where people have amassed the credentials. There just wasn't the credentialing that it, during the point. war immediately afterwards, because those credentials didn't exist. These fields didn't really exist as fields. Mm -hmm. And so now I think the, the companies that are hiring have to find ways to, again, to broaden the, um, to broaden the recruiting and broaden the approach. So yeah, that's a, yeah that's a, that is a great point about the credentialing. It was an all hands on deck. We just need the smartest people, the most capable people who, who can perform in this job, and we don't care where they come from. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? You guys? Yes, I'm up here. <laughs> oh, you can hold it. Okay. Dominique Carter, AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Science Foundation. Um, I just want to thank you both. Um, for the important work you're doing in terms of telling the stories of women in science. Um, I wanted to know if you could speak more on uh, the role that the media plays in the public perception of science and the scientific enterprise and how scientists can more effectively engage the public. Uh, well, I have to say, you know, one of the things that has been um, that has been uh, just fascinating about seeing first the story become a book and then seeing the book become a movie is how, and e even for people who have read the book, the things that people remember come from the movie. Like there is something about the power of a big story, a big narrative that makes people remember those details and to, you know, and not even the details, but to say, wow, it's really possible, you know? And so like, I've gotten tweets. I remember this one tweet from a mom who was telling me about her uh, fourth grade daughter who had been very math phobic um, and not, not bad at math, but math phobic or math averse, I guess, and had been trying to push her to study. And she, she saw the movie and then she told her mom, you know what? The numbers are going into my head just like Dorothy Vaughn. <laughs> and, um, and I think that there is um, the story that science gets as being all male, all white, all boring, you know, people who are incapable of having communications, um, people who have to sacrifice and sit on a mountaintop and not, not you know, engage with the rest of us. It's an incorrect narrative. You know, scientists are social, they're collaborative, they're female, they come in, you know, all different backgrounds. And so I think the power of taking that narrative and that science is fascinating, it's thrilling, it's exciting. Um, I think that, that that is the power that the media has to transform the way all of us see that particular field. And I think the flip side of that is that Hollywood and the publishing industry have tended to really love these stories of the lone, eccentric, tortured male genius. Mm -hmm. So whether it's Alan, whether yeah. it's Alan Turing, because there's an arc, you know, there's the brilliant moment and then there's the torturing. And, and so uh, Alan Turing, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the imitation game, um, A Beautiful Mind. Uh, and and these, these narratives tend to feed in the idea that there is this lone genius who's sort of achieved everything and nobody else really matters. But in fact, these, these enterprises are so collaborative. And so to be able to tell, like as Margaret did, to be able to convey that this was a group effort and each individual is unique and contributed, but somehow it's the coming together of all these talents, which really is how science works. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a challenge because you have to sell a publisher or sell Hollywood on a cohort narrative, which is not easy to write. You know, when am I going to bring in this character? And, uh, but it's, it really is the way that it happens. It's the way that it happens. As anyone who works in science or, or basically any other endeavor knows, everything is a group effort. You, you rely on the work of the people who came before. You support the work of the people who come after. You benefit from lots of different ideas. And yeah, but this lone, that Einstein 
right. idea is is the one that persists. Right, and that and and studies show that that is damaging to women's inclusion in the field. That if we cling to the idea that it's a genius, that you have to be a genius, we still tend to associate genius with men, mm -hmm. and and so this prejudice uh, continues to exist against anybody who's not uh, a, not sort of associated with that in our mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my name is Keisha Ash. I'm also a AAAS fellow at the National Science Foundation. Um, and I'm also from Hampton, Virginia, but I think a different part of Hampton because I knew nothing about NASA growing up. Um, and in fact, when I was in school, I gravitated you know, towards ma math and science because I had an aversion towards history, so I was history phobic. <laughs> and so my question to the both of you um, is in terms of the intersection of STEM careers and possibilities in history. Do you all see that happening at some day, uh, at some point in our educational system? And what will it take for us to embrace this intersection between our progress and our past? Uh, well, it's so nice to see another Hampton, Virginia native. And um, you know what? I, I did not take a single history course um, the four years that I was at, in college at UVA. I was history phobic as well. And um, <laughs> and had a father who pushed me to take all the math and science and ended up going into um, investment banking. That was my first career. Uh, but I really think that having, that we see these things as, as disparate and uh, conflictive and you know, they cannot coexist when they, they are so complementary. And you know, for me, learning the history of the science, so not just the history, but the history of the science, was one of the most it, thrilling, um, engaging, interesting things that I've ever done. You know, and I understand a lot more about everything. You know, every time I get on an airplane, I understand what's happening now because of the research that I did. Since these women were working on airplanes, um, and so I don't know. Maybe that that if you are in a STEM field, you are required to know the history of that particular field as a formal discipline, and I, I think that would help. Uh, the, uh, the, the practice of science and it would engage people who maybe don't want to be scientists and, and you know, are more of a humanities bent but love sciences and, and want to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wonder also if the credentialization sort of hurts. I was an English major in college and didn't take a lot of history and certainly didn't take a lot of STEM, although I, I, I did a lot of math in high school. And, you know, you get diverted onto these, onto these tracks. There may be more interdisciplinary majors available now. I was really wishing that I had taken the history of science. Because just yeah. like you, it was just wonderful. And in the case of trying to understand, I had to read a lot about code breaking. I had to try to understand cryptanalysis and how it worked and sort of teach myself. But I understood that the, these women were math, math majors or science and language majors, and it all helped. I mean, they had to they had to do math and language. They had to learn how to do frequency counts and understand that a certain number of letters, that there are certain letters in different languages that appear more often than others. And so they had to actually look at language in a more numerical way uh, and really use both of those talents. Um, but like Margot, I just, I, I found it, uh, it was like, it was like going to college again, but yeah. better. But better. So much better. <laughs> um, well, so much to dig into here, but that's unfortunately our time. Thank you so much, Liza and Margot. It was so good to be here. Thank you guys so much for coming.